<laughs> and you could uh, be in your house with no fans. Yeah, even though you have to like teach it and everything. Yeah, I, I know when I came in, I know. <laughs> you left everything open and then you were over there. Yeah, I know. Us. Where is the presentation that I have? The one you have? Yeah. You have to have to share it. No, it was on yeah, right. I know. I know. I thought of it. It's all tab two, actually. No, tab two. Oh, wow. Do we miss it? Yeah. You have to leave the first part? No, I just don't like you. And I'm only, I definitely don't want to get the audio. I'm asking hot questions. Pardon? What are you doing? It's actually going to be, I think, it was on the, so I looked over the and think it was on the and I was like, okay, maybe we need to get something a little bit more concise. Live coding, but I'm not sure how much live coding are.
This isn't, it's not clicking or anything. Yeah, this, this is not working as well. Why is it on the screen? Yeah. Well, no problem. Just log in again. I think you're good now. You can uh, yeah, check it out. Good. Yeah. Open house alumni presentation. The I probably I have some no I might have still tried to get to a different form of all admissions should have it. This one, beginner's guide. Yes. What is it? Sign in for us,
Okay, you are. Perfect. No, no, no. I just want to make sure that you are here. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Tanjali. Welcome to NYC Data Science Academy. Thank you for coming here on this very cold uh, day. And um, we welcome you all. This is the agenda for today. Uh, this is an open house and a free course demo. And I'm pretty sure that you all are interested in data science in some way or the other. So feel free to ask questions at any time if you have any. Uh, so the session would be about uh, 40 to 45 minutes and uh, we'll Sorry, we have uh, we are live streaming the session. So if you have any friends who are wanting to join the session online, please inform them. The details are on our Facebook and uh, Twitter page. So this is the agenda for today, and the session would be for about forty to forty-five minutes. Obviously, y'all are here for the data science bootcamp or uh, open house. A little bit about ourselves. Uh, so NYC Data Science Academy is one of the best rated data science boot camps uh, in the industry. We have been rated by SwitchUp and Course Report for a few consecutive years. Uh, we offer the boot camp in person and online. And if you need any more details, feel free to uh, visit our website or grab a flyer that's um, uh, in the student lounge. Uh, so we are the only boot camp that focuses only on data science, and that is our specialization. Uh, also, we are the only boot camp that teaches both Python and R, and our curriculum is uh, structured in a way that it focuses on both languages. Uh, we also offer lifetime career support. So if at all, if you're wanting to advance your career in data science or get into uh, the field, uh, we can help you find a job. And that can be any time after you graduate. So if you graduate, you get, your, get a job. And if you want to switch, you can come back to us after five years and we'll help you uh, get the job that you need. Uh, we have a network of more than uh, 500 hiring partners. So our alumni also go ahead and work in the industry. So they uh, come back to us and we have uh, sustained strength uh, relations with them. Uh, we also have an alumni network of more than uh, 2,000 2, alumni that includes our professional development courses as well as the bootcamp. So we have courses uh, in machine learning, uh, data analysis, and visualization. So if you're not interested in bootcamp and you want to start really from the ground, we also have these courses offered on the weekend as well as in the evenings. Uh, again, if you take the bootcamp, uh, you get to uh, work on a a capstone project, as well as there are three other projects that you get to work on, uh, which are hands-on and based on the industry uh, projects. And let people settle in. Uh, if there are people watching online, uh, please also free, feel free to ask questions uh, at all if you have at any time. So our admission process is very simple. Uh, there's an online application that you have to fill in. Uh, schedule an interview with one of our admissions officers. We have uh, our, our manager of enrollment, Carlos, and Manisa, who is our admissions officer here. So if you have any questions related to that, feel free to ask them. And there is a technical assessment that you have to fill if we are, you are graded on the basis of your skills, and then you get admitted into the boot camp. Uh, our upcoming cohorts, we have one started starting in April and uh, half of the batch is full. So if you're interested, you should act fast. This is the deadline, but sh you should really apply by the 20th of February. Uh, use this code uh, to get access to some of our resources. And we have another session starting in summer, which is one of our best selling um, or fast filling courses because a lot of students take this bootcamp before they get into the industry. Again, meet the team. If you have any questions regarding anything, feel free to grab some. This is an opportunity to also take a look around the campus. If you want to ask uh, any questions to our existing students or instructors, feel free. Again, 
I'm not going to take much of your time, uh, a lot of introduction and a lot of uh, overview about NYC Data Science Academy. I will uh, introduce Dres, who is our uh, bootcamp instructor. He's been uh, with us since uh, two or three years now, and he's excellent at what he does. So he'll take a deep dive and talk more about the beginner's guide to data science. Welcome. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Pranjali. Um, I'm not sure about a deep dive. A uh, deep dive might take a little longer than the amount of time we have today for this specific session. Uh, but uh, so a little bit about myself in terms of the background. Yeah, my name is Grace Zahn. I am one of the instructors of the program here. My specific component that I teach is Python uh, and as well as natural language processing. And also we'll be touching into uh, a little bit of machine learning uh, using R as well in the future. So what we're going to cover today is actually more of how to get started in the field. What are some things and items you should know? Uh, as I mentioned, when the marketing team approached me about uh, what would be a useful, top, informative topic for people out, uh, out there, I said, okay, well, I often see that a lot of folks, when they are looking to essentially join the industry, they're really not sure of just where to begin. And unfortunately, uh, what ends up happening is they will go online and just look up like kind of the, you know, the equivalent of a dummy's guide to data science. And uh, online, there's a lot of good information, a lot of good information, but also a lot of not so good information where people tend to use more of the platform to just kind of promote themselves as data scientists rather than help the community. So knowing kind of where to look and who, to, uh, who will be more of a source of info is important. So hopefully, some of what we provide here today will let you get a better sense of how to gauge when you are, where you are seeking uh, these sort of uh, insights in the future and how to really, really begin your journey in, uh, in the field. For those of you who are interested also in joining the, uh, joining the industry and beginning the, your journey through us, that's great to hear. Uh, just as a full like, kind of caveat and disclaimer, this is also part of what I hope to also introduce to our students as well. So some of the content then you will hear from day one as well in the future. Okay, so, oh, whoop, that's not my, that's not the content I wanted to talk about today. It's it. <laughs> Should be this one, okay. All right, give that a quick moment. What? Uh, there we go, okay. so. First and foremost, this is just more of a snapshot for me to give a snapshot of based upon our student profiles, what are the different sectors you could end up going to as well as the different position types in the data science industry. So you can see here data analysts, data engineers, data scientists, principal data scientists, what do they mean? And essentially what are their roles going to entail essentially from a day-to-day -day perspective? This is not to say that like, if you don't come from this type of background, you won't make it. It's actually not true at all. Companies look for a, very, a variety of different skills for their, these various positions. And actually at the uh, end of the day, a large part of actually the component of whether or not you get that job is whether they like you too. So that's something to take into account. But essentially data analyst, Selena came from something more of a business background, knew how to ask like good questions from like in, in terms of that perspective. So very often data analysts, you're gonna be working with uh, SQL a whole lot. Uh, and often this uh, neglected, I would say, area that people practice, but it's all about extracting data and then also off leveraging the business insight and your experience to essentially deliver some sort of analysis on the data that you are extracting and so forth. Uh, Dean Goldman, uh, he, he had actually one of the uh, more interesting backgrounds of how to both enter the program and also enter the industry. I was actually the one who uh, evaluate, did his uh, evaluation and tech assessment and so forth. And his background, he actually had a degree in fine arts and it was in painting specifically. But what I observed is when I looked at his resume, he had a lot of, of years of actual software engineering experience. So immediately that to me already signaled that he was likely a lot more, a lot better actually then some of the stereotypical candidates who just kind of goes through like a, uh, a stereotype, like a standard, I would say educational profile with like all the check marks. Because usually I find that people who are, have been in the industry from a different uh, 
from a different career choice when they started off their education, but they've been at it for quite some time, they tend to have already that self-drive to like really, really hack, uh, know how to hack or do what it takes to basically succeed in the program. Unsurprisingly, he did, and he is now working as a data engineer. It's exactly what it sounds like, a lot of engineering tasks. So in other words, not only do you have to be very familiar with databases as a whole, but you also have to understand what data scientists are typically looking for. And more importantly, how to store your data efficiently, because that's a large part of what, how data engineers save their company money, and also how to work with big data as well. So often we're gonna talk, uh, they're gonna work with AWSs, other cl uh, cloud computing tools, know, understand how to deploy and so forth. We're gonna talk a little bit more about kind of how that looks like later on as well. Uh, Sheetal uh, has a more, I would say, standard background. Uh, if I recall correctly, she has a MS in information systems and she has already had a business analyst background, if I recall correctly on, off the top of my head on that side. She had a, a good mastery of both the quantitative side, the people skills, and also the coding, uh, obviously, that the bootcamp provides. So we're gonna take a look at like what that triangle will look like in terms of the skills on a uh, deeper level in a bit. But essentially, it, we're talking about someone who kind of does a, is able to do a little bit of everything. And that's basically what it comes down to. Uh, Mikhail, he, if I recall correctly, has a PhD in computational finance. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head for all of these backgrounds. I actually wish they gave me a little bit of a primer in this one. But um, so he's a principal data scientist at Fidelity. He also received a few different offers from various other companies in similar roles as well. Now, what, he comes down, uh, what it comes down to is, A, he already had a heavy amount of work experience in the industry. I believe he was involved in the financial sector for about 10 to 15 years uh, from his work experience side. Then he came to the bootcamp, of course, received the extra, uh, the cert extra training, but more importantly, also the network connections and so forth that the co program provides. So he was able to leverage that. And essentially a principal data scientist, you could do obviously the standard work of data scientists, but more likely you're also gonna be involved in a lot of decision-making processes as a whole. So what that sometimes entails is unfortunately, for me at least, uh, I tend to like to get my hands dirty, but the higher you climb in the ranks, the more you might just end up being in a lot of meetings and kind of vetting data science decisions for your team and recruiting data scientists for your team and giving them direction than doing the actual hands-on work. So uh, pays obviously great, but for someone like myself who likes to kind of get in their hands dirty, you know, it might not be necessarily something that you are looking for despite the obviously elevation of the title. So that's just more of a heads up. And I'll talk a little, say a little bit about uh, the scaling and the skill set required to get something like along those lines, not just the work experience and the industry insight, but additional things that you should take into account as well. Okay, so uh, first I wanna kick off with uh, what I consider the most important things for students to be aware of when they're beginning their foray into the, uh, into the, well, essentially this industry, which is what should you always have in your toolkit at the bare, bare basics? What I would expect to see if I were to hire you as a data scientist for my team this is already what I expect you to have, at least have proficiency of, okay? So as I said, it's essentially like a, tr it's closer to a triangle, but I didn't know how to, I'm not great at PowerPoint on my side. So I just laid it out in this way, but three uh, core items are the math, well, more specifically linear algebra and stats. So linear algebra is essentially a large amount of both how, how uh, most of the algorithm would do with computations. So it's placed to your advantage of A, when you know it, you can read the papers a lot easier. And what I mean by papers are often, for example, if I were asked to do certain tasks, I might not have necessarily learned about the correct way of actually how to handle that specific task. And in fact, chances are that information is not easily found because if it was, they wouldn't be paying me to do that specific task. So what will I often have to do? I'll have to dig through research papers that might give some sort of hint about how to whether it will work for the task I'm trying to solve at hand or not. Or for example, if I'm trying to train a team and I think that there might be a specific algorithm for them to like actually have to know, what I actually need to be able to do is when I see those papers, I have to be able to read them and understand how the math works. And a heavy amount of linear algebra is going to be involved in order to really know whether or not this, that specific model or algorithm makes sense for the task you're given. Statistics, uh, specifically inferential statistics, well, A, obviously let you compose most of your experiments when need be, 
but also help you understand some uh, it's essentially better, uh, better of whether or not the model's output will be able to, will actually be trustworthy or not, what sort of decisions can you make from there, from the actual uh, data, like data back point of view. That's where stats, a lot of stats come in. Uh, programming, I'm gonna uh, see if I can even show you a little bit of that, maybe upcoming. Uh, where, so these are some of the, uh, the common tools of the trade. You don't need to have like them. First of all, you shouldn't have them all because what, as long if you know one programming language uh, very well and it tends to have fundamentals that can be translated to any other language anyway, uh, the more basic programming language you go, the better it will scale in terms of translating to other languages. What I mean by that is specifically C and Java, respectively speaking because A, they kind of are the building blocks uh, as far as the other programming languages are kind of uh, go upon, especially C itself. But for those of you who are not coming from like a software engineering background, that's not necessarily the best place for you to start because the issue with C and Java, Java not so much, but C especially is it's very difficult to learn, especially on your own. It usually, uh, I would recommend if you are looking to get uh, learn C, you probably should go to school for it actually. Uh, Julia, Go, there's some of the up and coming languages that are getting, gaining more popularity, uh, be, mainly because of their backers, MIT and Google respectively speaking. But the core of it is if you're not sure which direction, go with R or Python. I'll make some recommendations uh, as well on these specific languages based on uh, where you're coming from as far as your background is concerned. But R and Python is really where it's at for the, I would say the, uh, the core of data science languages if you're not sure where, where to start. They also, on the plus side, they tend to be easier to learn than something like Java and C. Go and Julia, they are actually also very friendly for beginners as well. They're built that way. So, uh, but like I said, they haven't gained as much clout in the industry yet as, uh, as Python and R. So I would start, rec I would recommend Python or R first. And from there on, once you understand it, it's fairly easy for you to actually go to G Go or Julia anyway. Okay. And then finally, uh, the last part, is arguably how you are capped in the industry, okay? I would say first, when you are going to your, uh, sending your resume for the first time or meeting an, uh, a, an employer for the first time, you're always going to be evaluated at the lowest you go in V3. But in terms of scalability, it really is the last point. That is how advanced of the title you can receive. And that really just unfortunately comes down to work experience. And it doesn't have to be, you have to be uh, just have the title data scientist in your resume for X amount of years. Of course that helps. But if you're attending this talk, well, this wasn't the talk for those of you, for those of you to have data scientists who already have the data scientist title for X amount of years. This is a talk for beginners. So what can you take away instead? If you have a work experience that is also relevant to the industry you are going to be employed as a data scientist, that's also very valuable as well. So for example, prior earlier, when I showed uh, the case of Mikolo, he was one example of that, where he had 10 to 15 years in, of experience in finance already. So obviously that was able to really help him leverage his, uh, be able to get his position as a principal data scientist. So experience gives you uh, the insight of actually what are the most relevant problems that is required to be solved with data, but it also lets you combine that understanding with how you work with the data and how you approach the data in the first place. Um, this is very, I would say, high level right now. It might not mean a whole lot without concrete examples. And unfortunately for today's talk, I, I just realized actually it's going, time is going by much faster than I anticipated. I mean, I'm only going to be able to show you guys the iris data set, and there's not a whole lot of <laughs> there's a whole lot you need from that one to show you for, uh, for experience side, but you will see that um, as you work on, say, an actual problem, very often you're going to be able to do a lot more with the data that you're already familiar with, where you already have some experience with. For example, if you come from, let's say, uh, the gaming industry, uh, you might work with sale, uh, sales of uh, console, say, uh, console platforms types of data better than someone who is coming from maybe like ed tech, they might want to work with students' uh, admissions data or enrollment data or student performance data. Someone in ad click might understand how to work with click-through rate data and so forth. So it really depends on like kind of where, you're, uh, where they are placed. And if you are trying to enter as a data scientist into a field that's, that's very close to some uh, area you transition 
from, it is going to help a little bit because of the fact that you're able to add that extra uh, insight of, well, how do you really interpret the data based on your actual experience as well. Written and visual communication is huge because especially if you go to consulting, but even if you don't, after a while, you are going to just be building a lot of slide decks of because no one's going to really look at like your code when you are trying to like deliver value to the stakeholders. They're just going to look at, well, what are your results? Like how prove to me that you know what you're talking about and I should invest this extra amount into your department. And that just comes down to a lot and a lot of slide decks and discussions. So, and that's just, uh, that's just the reality of the case, which is why I said, ultimately you are going to find that the cap of how far you could go as far as your title is concerned will be the very last point, okay? Uh, any questions uh, from this part for now? Okay. All right, so you might be wondering, how do I practice this kind of, uh, these specific skills? As I said, there are a lot of good resources out there on the internet, actually completely for free. The only issue is A, what I see for most students on why they can't do a, be a do go through the journey themselves using only pure free resources. A, the motivation it is, I'm gonna be perfectly candid. Most people want to be paid and doing the work of a data scientist. They don't necessarily wanna do the work to get there. That's probably going, if I were to say like about the percentage wise, I would, that would likely be close to 95% of people I encounter. <laughs> okay, so why do people go to boot camp? Same reason why you pay to go to the gym. You paid, you, got, you made an investment, now you feel like you had to bank on this investment. In addition, the other thing it does is give you some sort of structure and guidance. So that's often why people find that like paying to get told here's what you need to do is uh, their preferred path. But I'm gonna talk about how you can also get started for absolutely free already, okay? Because I wanna make sure that at least, at the very least, you guys can still do stuff without just joining a boot camp. So what is the very, uh, for math, what are some recommendations I have? Uh, courses, online, in-person, a lot of online courses now from universities like, uh, that are sponsored through Coursera and similar, uh, uh, similar uh, websites. You can find them even for free. You can also not only find videos, but you could of course find like things like offered by sites like W3School for SQL very easily too. Uh, but for math, I find uh, there's a good amount of courses that are, very strong online in specific topics. They could go very deep and you're going to get, you could get a very good ed, uh, education about the mathematic uh, component just from those. Uh, MIT Open Courseware is uh, excellent for this. I also recommend you have some textbooks because uh, one uh, mistake I see a lot of uh, folks doing when they're trying to learn material is they just watch videos because these are, this is a generation where it's very easy to con con uh, consume video content. You could just, sit on front of the computer passively and you, could, and you feel like you've done something then at the end of say the hour or whatever it is. But very often I find that's not enough. You really need to actually put, do some practice exercises and have some solid reading and so forth. I still believe in the, uh, the, the more old school approach of you have a textbook, you do some exercise out of it, you practice it and then, and then you go back and you watch a lecture to understand like how, whether or not you approached it correctly or understand the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the theorems behind things. So the two uh, books I will recommend, for most of you, I would say ISLR and just kind of stop there, okay? And the reason why is ISLR is a very um, gentle introduction to the math required for data science. Now, if you don't have a lot of math training beforehand, ISLR will not feel like a gentle introduction but it's about as gentle as you can get away with, okay? Uh, if you are coming from more of a math background, then ESLR can, you can look into. The two acronyms, if you just Google them, you could easily find what they stand for. ISLR, Introduction to Statistical Learning using R, ESLR, Elements of Statistical Learning in R, okay? Uh, if you are towards the latter, one thing you should be aware of is ESLR is written at like a PhD level. So if you are really interested in going into research in data science, ESLR is going to be enough for all you need, but it will take a long time to get through that book. Uh, I 
am not embarrassed and ashamed to say I am actually working through the book myself. It's a, it's a bit of a slog. You can really, really get bogged down with the derivations and understanding how that applies to the theorem at, and how they came up with it and why it even works the way it does. And I think a standard exercise in the ESLR book on the more intermediate level probably takes about one or two hours to solve, both using R and by hand as well. So you can usually do a little bit of both when trying to solve those exercises. Okay. So coding, once again, there's a whole lot of resources out there, even more than for the math. There's a ton of coding platforms. All, some, of, uh, some of them, uh, to, I would say, uh, are very friendly to beginners, though I would say you probably want to upgrade from them as soon as possible. I don't want to name them because they sound like I'm putting certain ones down and elevating others. But one thing I would just, so instead what I'll say is, at the end of the day, the only way to get better at coding is just to code. There is nothing else besides that. You can watch as many videos as you want. You can attend as many classes, but if you're not coding and you're watching, let's say, a thousand hours of videos on how to code and somebody just coded for 10 hours, they probably will, can, do be can code better than you, all right? Because so much of how co programming uh, work, like how you learn programming is to realize it is a language. It has syntax, it has rules, it even has rules of how it should be used that are quote unquote unspoken of, but everyone understands once they used it enough, okay? And for example, what I mean by that is there's an official way to actually write Python properly. That's not like taught in say, one of very, uh, most of these coding lecture classes that you'll end up taking. So that only comes from practice. And then as you get more game, more practice, you start seeing that people are solving exercise a certain way, coding a certain way. And then you naturally instill those rules to, uh, in you. Much like how when you learn a different language, the only way to get really good at it is they tell you, they throw you in the country and tell you, well, now you got to find out how to get around. And you naturally start through use, get better and better in terms of the fluency, understanding grammar and so forth. So for coding, there's really no shortcuts. The amount of hours you spend with your hands on front of the keyboard and actually typing commands is the main, I would say, predictor of how strong of a coder you are. This is why when I talked about Dean Goldman earlier, the very first thing I saw was, okay, he had a background in like a bachelor's in painting. But in, when I saw, okay, wait, he had six years of experience as a Java software developer. I knew he would have no issues working in Python, even if he didn't touch it in, in his life before. Because I, A, I know how, what Java is like, learning Java and working with it is like. And two, I know he must have spent a lot of time actually coding. So sure enough, he had no issues picking up coding and that's why he was able to do a data engineering job. Which is actually, by the way, um, while it doesn't sound as sexy as data scientist, it's uh, when I now meet a lot of uh, companies and I evaluate what their needs are, very often engineer, like ev almost every team I meet can always, has always either mentioned to me they could use more engineers or I could evaluate that they need more engineers. So if you don't mind, and, or maybe even your idea of a, good job is just doing a lot of coding and solving problems with code and understanding efficiencies of databases and management and how to keep a database clean, how to create pipelines and so forth. Uh, I'm probably not making it sound as fun as, it, it really actually is not that, it's actually, I find it pretty fun, but uh, then you could consider going down that route because it's very, very, uh, it's very, very uh, in demand and also, the plus side is it's actually a little bit easier to enter because you can just specialize. You can, you should have still some fundamental understanding of math because this will help you know what the data science team will often require, ask from you when they're asking for pull requests or their data is being asked for your data, their data to be structured in a certain way and so forth. Um, but you don't really need a whole lot of, I would say like written and visual communication. You could just really, really cram one component. And it, then it becomes a lot easier because you just need to focus on one core skill as a result. Okay. Uh, some 
good coding books off the top of my head. The main one I recommend, you can actually even find for free online. But I would recommend pulling up a hard copy or purchasing the hard copy. I think this guy get, should get a lot of credit. Uh, in fact, I will say he is really the one who helped me click when it comes to uh, for Python to click for me is this book, Automate the Boring Stuff. There's also, uh, well, it's not popping up. It's not popping up. How do I? Okay, my team, <laughs> the, the, the team abandoned me <laughs> for how to uh, share this as a primary window. Uh, okay, well, that's fine. Um, so the book, yeah, if you, have your, uh, if you have your machines, you can even Google it right now. It's literally called Automate the Boring Stuff. Okay, and it should be the, the site itself is also automate the boring stuff. There's a book link right there for the hard copy, but they provide all the chapters for free. And it's really good with a lot of exercises at the end of each chapter that basically forces you to synthesize how uh, the coding works in regards to those exercises. You're basically forced to put your hands on the keyboard and try to solve those exercises. That's my number one recommendation. Uh, learn Python the hard way is often the the, uh, the one that most uh, places recommend. I actually think that that book is a little bit better suited for software engineering than data science because it does go into more of a nitty gritty detail on some of the items you need to know from Python and a programming standpoint, but it doesn't quite sh ease you in for starters the way that Automate the Boring Stuff does, but also doesn't make you do practical examples right off the bat. So I tend to prefer Automate the Boring Stuff as my recommendation, but Learn Python the Hard Way is a great book for learning Python like itself. If you just are thinking of also the software engineering side, you go through that angle, okay? Okay. Uh, I really hope they are around when I want to code because now I can't even show you guys <laughs> something that you guys can do with code. Uh, Carlos, go. are we getting one of them coming? Okay, great, all right. Oh, Anjali, you're able to. Okay, um, if you can, uh, how do I put another sc screen? Okay. And then you can open ah, okay, because I will actually also want them to. Uh, so this was automated boring stuff, okay? And also, similarly, like I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of great, uh, uh, the, all the recommendations I'm giving you are actually free and easy to find online. As I said, there's a lot of good uh, resources online and you just have to know where to look and wh what to trust. The LSLR handbook, once again, same thing. You can get it for free online. I recommend, same idea, I'm more of a, I like to have the hard copy uh, with me. So this way I could flip through it, make notes on it and so forth, but you could download the text as well. Elements of statistical learning, actually, let's just shorten it. Uh, This one require, cannot easily Google. So same exact idea, could grab the book on, online for free, okay? Give you a quick moment to load. It's a fair, this one linked directly to the PDF of the book. So obviously it's pretty large and you can see here, okay? So as I said, those, uh, those are all readily found. Okay. Let me go back to where I was. Not there yet. Uh, and then finally, uh, communication. This is actually the hardest thing to practice and train. I try to rack my brain for what are good ways. The only thing I could think of is really Toastmasters so you get more comfortable with speaking. Uh, I heard good things about them, but otherwise the part about communication that's very difficult is a lot of instances when people first hear about data science from outside the industry, they read a typical description of what they would, what would be good signs that they are a data scientist. And what I often tell people is that like those signs are meaningless because everyone will always think the best of themselves. And those descriptions tend to be very like flattering because obviously they're meritorious uh, descriptions. And the most common one is they 
have, they are creative and they like to solve problems and they like to ask interesting questions. You guys probably all read about those descriptions as well. You probably saw it somewhere. And I said, well, no one's ever gonna tell themselves, like read that and think, you know, I'm not very creative. I also don't like to question things. And uh, I don't like to solve problems. No one's ever gonna say that. But the core reality is most people are actually not built and trained with those skills because those are skills that you need to be trained through. In fact, even something as uh, primal and old as the standardized exams, you'll realize the core of it was just trying to test your critical thinking because critical thinking is so difficult to train that it's much easier to just work with someone who already has a good amount of it than to re steadily train you in it. Whereas if I were to train you in programming, I could literally just say, okay, do this exercise today. Let me go read it. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what mistakes you made. Go back to the drawing board. If I had to teach you math, I'll just teach you math like a standard lecture. But critical thinking, I have no real way of teaching someone how to critical think because when I show them one problem and how to approach it, the next problem is totally different. And sometimes I don't even have the best answer. I just have one answer. So there's very, it's very hard to learn this in any program, but it's very, very important if you are looking to do the science part of data science, because science is all about asking the right questions. You eventually ask yourself the right questions and that's how you know this is the experiment I should formulate to test now this question or this theory or hypothesis or what may have you. So at the end of the day, the only thing I could say is try to solve a problem you enjoy. Uh, that's the only thing I could really think of. Uh, and what I mean by that is do not go too complicated, ambitious. Don't think about, okay, well, let me think about how to, uh, you know, optimize Netflix's uh, algorithm. That's not a problem you necessarily enjoy because that's actually largely an engineering problem, by the way, just a heads up. So instead I meant more like, well, if you notice that you have a certain workout schedule, can you automate it in some way? Automate a system of reminders for yourself, set up, a, set up some sort of process where you could evaluate whether or not certain workout you do is actually going to be beneficial compared to others. What kind of data can you extract to actually help you uh, see that? Uh, maybe it comes down to like, oh, you notice you're sending a lot of the same emails over and over again. Well, learn how to do it with an API call instead. So you could actually send out automated emails in a certain process. Uh, maybe it could be to yourself as reminders. Um, so these are just like some general ideas and you'll notice most of it has to do with your day-to-day -day practices. And the reason why I emphasize this is very often uh, when people are first thinking about data science, they're immediately not thinking about data science. They're thinking about AI because that's obviously the hot topic and that's what's commonly talked about. So they immediately go into the research vector and think that that's the real area where they should just like go as far as data science is concerned. And it's actually not. If you look at actually the most uh, profitable tech companies out there, FANG, they do and solve very basic problems. Google tells you how to find something. Facebook helps you talk to people. Amazon gets things to your house. But obviously data science is used to solve all of those questions. But yes, those are not the questions that students are often practicing. They're not thinking, they're thinking like, oh, it's boring for me to try to understand how to map out a logistic route and how to just simply like maybe make like one route just one minute faster. Well, you make one route one minute faster, you, you can A, expand on that theorem. Oh, okay, I'm, uh, I was just told I was running out of time. <laughs> but you, may, you run out of, you know, you make one route optimized by like one minute, you obviously save many, many minutes across the board at that point. And you'll often see that those are the type of tasks that people are able to solve. And until you have a good idea of how to solve problems on like this, the fundamental level, using data and your experience to inform your practices, it's very difficult for you to make the next leap into the industry. And often what ends up happening is when I evaluate a student project or so forth, I always have to tell them, look, this is just like, I could tell right off the bat that this is a school project. And yes, you're in the bootcamp program, it's academic, but your goal should not be doing a school project. You could have done this in a grad school. Your goal should be to produce some sort of project that can show you have demonstrable skills for a potential employer. 
Uh, I found that unfortunately I cannot do some live coding uh, in front of you because of timing constraints. Uh, actually, it might be. All right, I I'm gonna really quickly show you if you don't come from a programming background because I just think it's fun. Uh, what will look like black magic for a bit. If you do have some experience in coding or you already played around with a little bit of yourself, uh, you will be able to follow. You don't have to do, be able to do this off the top of your head, but I'm just gonna say why something like RStudio and uh, Jupyter Notebook, why they are uh, often the recommended platforms to practice with. RStudio, first of all, because it was the language built for data science, okay? First and foremost, it was built for data science. The, not like Python where it's built for programming, R was just built for data science. So it even goes as far as to remember the ISLR handbook. Well, the ISLR handbook even has packages in R that you can use to do those specific exercises. So for example, first I could go and import a library of ISLR, okay? And then I will know, I know that built in, there are already data sets for me to work out of. One very common one, for example, is the student loans data set, okay? And I could just simply quickly view it as a snapshot in my console to see like, okay, this is how a snapshot of how the data set would look like. There's also a lot of built in plotting capabilities in R right out of the box. You don't need to import anything. So for example, what makes sense is maybe some sort of box plot. I want to see uh, what does it look like in terms of balances of uh, students, uh, people who are the amount that they owe at the balance for folks who are students and folks who aren't. So I could do something like, um, let's see if I can remember this off the top of my head. Default uh, dollar sign balance uh, uh, and then default dollar sign student. Okay, so voila, we could kind of like just plot and it'll automatically be able to just give you the visualization you require. And you can make this prettier if you elect to. There's a color parameter. You can select color equals to uh, either a specific color, like maybe red. Actually red needs to be typed like this. Or you could do something like color according to another column, for example. And with Python, you do need to do a little bit more work Okay, and this is what to show you why I want to say like Python, it was built just more as a programming tool, but so it doesn't come right readily out of the box for data science. But if you want to learn something that is much more flexible, for example, it can integrate well with other people's applications and scripts, you will go through Python. So Python, you're going to see me now do all sorts of uh, importing because I need a bunch of things to help me do data science at Python. These are some of the more standard ones. Okay, so you don't need to know these right off the bat, like I said, but once as you obviously work in the industry more, you're gonna find this is just like second nature because you would have done it so often already. So with now, earlier you saw already built into R, there's a bunch of data sets. Here, same thing, we can import in a common machine learning package, which already has data sets built in. We could also grab them from uh, Pandas as well, which is another library that has some data sets built in. And from pi earlier here in R, you'll notice that all I did to grab the data set was just get it from library. And I already just knew, could just view the data set right off the bat. Python, not so much. Python, you would have to do something uh, along these lines instead. Uh, no, data sets, import. So this would be like, for example, the, how you would grab the iris data set. And we're still not done. Actually, to go, you still have to go one step further. And I'm actually doing a bit of a shortcut, some shortcuts just to save some lines, but also uh, for the sake of time. I think it's get feature names. No, I think it's get feature names or feature names. This last part, this last line might be wrong. 
This last part might be wrong. Oh, no, it wasn't. Good. Okay, and now, now I could grab it. So this is an example. See, as you can see, there's a bit, a, a bit more work. Uh, now, you won't have to do any of the cold right off the bat. I'm, I would say that's a terrible example to like expect as an expectation, but it's more to show you that as you can see, Python, not so much right out of the box. However, the benefit of Python is I can build some functions with it that can integrate well with other languages if need to, but also of course, because a lot of applications are also built in Python, okay? So that's just a snapshot of that. So as I mentioned, our studio, Jupyter, uh, Jupyter, these are the main areas where you could grab, uh, grab the tools of need. I think uh, the marketing and admissions team could probably uh, validate that. They're gonna, we, we can send these slides out as well so you could get the links. Also, finally, for practicing SQL, my SQL Workbench has a very easy uh, interface. You could point and click to get a lot of the SQL commands. So you could use that in addition to, I think W3 schools had a very good SQL tutorial, help you practice your SQL skills that way. All right. Uh, there's no way I can have enough time to go into machine learning <laughs> in uh, the amount of time I have left. So, um, but I'll uh, do what I can. How much time? I, I, have not, I need like 15 minutes at least. Okay. All right. So the bread and butter of where the math comes in for data science and your uh, expertise is going to be needed as you develop your skills is actually going to be obviously the machine learning part because that's A, the more exciting part, uh, area, but also the part where you do really have a, to, you must have a critical understanding of the data and also the algorithms you believe will actually tackle the type of problem that is arising with the data you are given, okay? So in a perfect world, this is the workflow that you will go through when you are essentially asked to solve a generic data science task out there. Uh, they, there's no such thing uh, as generic data science, but I'm just saying as, uh, as generalizable as possible, uh, I could break it into these three stages. Now, that being said, very often what will happen is what's known as CRISP-DM is because there's actually a loop because you will often go back and forth between these stages as you discover more insights about the data and also the process that you are working through as, it might, as you mine more information from it. But the very first part you start off with is always the problem statement, what is your task at hand? So as an easy example, this might be the question you are just thrown. And your data will not provide any of it necessarily right from first glance. In fact, it usually shouldn't because if it was that easy to solve, they wouldn't need you around. So often from there, you need to know, okay, I have data guys who maintain a data lake or a data warehouse. I need to know and I have a snapshot of what kind of things I might already be interested in according to what I know from experience, what they, the client told me or what my boss told me, uh, what I already ha have from like maybe in front of me and, and the like. So from there on, you will go and collect the data accordingly, okay? Often this is some sort of, you're working with your database guy to extract the relevant data that you need for your, uh, your purposes. From there, you would assess your, and do some sort of analysis on the data itself to see, well, does it solve the question? Does it offer some idea of how to solve the problem at hand? Have some sort of hypothesis, potentially create new features. What I mean by that is, you can, for example, if you have uh, text data, that's the data I most uh, actually have a fair amount of experience with, you get text data. It could just be like news articles. So you will need to transform that text data into some sort of numerical data. So there are various methods you can approach that with. And that's kind of like one example of create and extract features. That's just one example, but there's other, many others, of course. And then you will have maybe some hypothesis you wish to test, not maybe, you should have some hypothesis you wish to test. You would do that, and often what happens is you're stuck at this stage for a long, long time. Because as I said, there is the, in, when we're talking about company data, when I say data lake, it's exactly what it sounds like. There's all ton. 
And most of it will not be relevant to solving your question. So when you first grab some, you often want to return them and say, say like, do you have something else? This part didn't work, this part does work, and so on and so forth. So there's a good amount of time already spent at this stage. And then you will go into when you feel comfortable with the behavior of the data, you will offer some sort of models that should solve the problem. And that's kind of where the hypothesis also comes in as well. You have some sort of hypothesis that this model will solve my problem because the data fits this sort of trend. Uh, or in the industry, this would be the trend that we are looking to, uh, to mimic. So you will select some sort of algorithm to suit that task at hand, fit it, and then you don't usually go to the next stage right away. Often, you'll find you need to do some sort of refinement. So that's why I said you'll see that this loops over and over again for a bit, quite a bit, and can literally take anywhere from maybe a, two weeks to like years, depending on, of course, the task at hand. And then when you're finally satisfied at the prototype, you will be able to deploy it. And that often means putting it on some sort of cloud uh, or deploy it into some sort of uh, container. And we're gonna see a little bit of that uh, example of what I mean by that in a bit, okay? So what are the common tasks you are going to often be asked in machine learning? It basically kind of breaks down into, ultimately the end result will be one of these three, okay? Prediction, for example, uh, it's pretty straightforward is that in terms of the description, what each of these say. Prediction is saying like, okay, we wanna know, okay, well, how, uh, how, what, how many, you know, if we do X, how will our sales, uh, will our sales increase? Or would there be a change in sales by Y amount? Uh, forecasting is, once again, exactly what it sounds like. So we implement these things. What is the behavior in the trend in the next X time range, days, years, whatever it may be? So prediction is usually, you could think, uh, you will have heard of seeing uh, mathematical topics such as regression. It's essentially what uh, is often used in that to solve that problem. Forecasting, often some sort of time series model. For example, for those of you who uh, come from finance, you would have known about, you would have heard about ARIMA, for example, uh, GARSH, uh, SARIMA, et cetera, et cetera. Classification, uh, one, once again, fairly straightforward. Uh, often it is, we wanna know, okay, well, the most common example they always give is if cancer is benign or malignant. So classification is actually one of the, uh, I would say a very common task, uh, more specifically in the area of what we call imbalance classes. So often classification requires very heavy understanding of how to tackle the problem with the models you are given because most models out of the box uh, is very good at evaluating what is a common condition or class and often what people are most interested in the, uh, in the industry is what is not common. Obviously most people are healthy. You wanna diagnose things that are signs that they are not healthy, much, much harder. So uh, that's, uh, this is one, uh, one uh, kind of example of how uh, classification kind of works in the industry. So these are the, uh, I would say the categories of machine learning problems you are electing to solve. Now, some of you may say, what about clustering and so forth? Usually anything outside of these three ranges are areas of machine learning that is used to inform one of these three tasks, okay? Such as, for example, well, image recognition uh, is classification technically, but image recognition often involve a lot of clustering. So clustering, you use that to then help you eventually solve this sort of task as an example, okay? All right, so what are then common math uh, topics that are nebulous in all of these? What I mean by that is when you learn about regression, uh, when you learn about classification, uh, what are things that are, you're just gonna need to know when you are handling the math? Is these extra topics, I actually just realized what I don't have here is also required, which is uh, uh, some sort of model selection or validating your results. Uh, but I'll go into that as well. So regularization is pretty straightforward. Your data is often gonna have a lot of what we call noise. Noise are essentially just erroneous signals to what you're trying to predict. 
So you have that in, your model is going to come out and going to either be junk right off the bat, or it will have instability when you are trying to predict future data that it does, your model does not know, which is, of course, what usually people are interested in. You're not interested in the current answer. You're interested in answer you don't have. Uh, parameter tuning. Often models will, actually not often, every model will have some sort of inputs. So the parameter, uh, including also how the model behaves, parameter tuning is geared more toward the latter. I'm not talking about the inputs of the model, but more of how the model behaves. What I mean by that is, for example, you can choose to, uh, I'll use a very basic example. Uh, you might find that your model right now, when you have the, actually the calculation written out, it's basically a straight line. You might want to choose to insert some sort of parameter that chooses so that it actually performs closer to a sine wave instead, because that is the type of the, uh, behavior you believe your data actually falls under. So you would do some sort of parameter, you could do some sort of parameter tuning. In this instance, it's actually what's called selecting maybe a kernel that will cause it to actually fit to that type of behavior. Dimension reduction, it actually bar bleeds a little over from regularization, but essentially the idea of when you have linear algebra, the fundamental theorem is, one of the fundamental rules is if you have more columns than you have rows, you cannot do what we call solving a matrix, which is literally actually the same thing as when you were back in, uh, I would say like probably junior high, high school, when you're solving linear equations, you'll probably, if you try to, you'll see that it's same exact concept. If you try solving for four different variables and you're only given three li different linear equations, you cannot solve for the values of those variables. The amount of solutions is infinite. So dimensional reduction is that exact idea. We say, okay, instead of four variables for you to solve, solve two. So we get rid of two of them somehow. So that's the quark idea of uh, dimension reduction, but it also does various other things and has various other benefits such as it will reduce computational cost, assist your visualization. Also, uh, it will fix some of what we call the curse of dimensionality, where the more dimensions, if you, and this is, once again, it sounds, it's, math always have these, uh, like what I would say, difficult entry level ideas when you first hear about them. But once you think more to basics of what you've learned, they're actually fairly intuitive. Curse of dimensionality, one of the ideas is, well, if you have two dimensions and you just measure it, let's say the distance between two lines, obviously that's just the absolute value, right? You, multi you add a third dimension into it, it now becomes Euclidean distance. You have to square at some point. So the diagonal that you saw from even the hypotenuse uh, the, of a triangle already shows you it's gonna be greater than any of the other legs. So that even is just a very simple idea of how as you get higher dimensions, the distance between points, if you project them to higher and higher dimensions, you induce more, visualize them to the higher dimensions, the distance is gonna be farther. So certain algorithm will then not respond correctly because it operates under certain assumptions. And feature engineering, um, you're gonna have to do a lot of this. <laughs> it's what it sounds like. I don't have time to explain it because it's actually very in depth. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Uh, you all have to, unfortunately, this is a, a crux, a, a large part of data science is understanding how to uh, have create mine data from the data you're already given. And that's the core of what feature engineering actually is. Like, and for obvious reasons, I just don't have, I won't have time to discuss an example of that. Um, so finally, assuming you do all of that, what can you do? Well, you're not done yet. The fruit of your labor still needs to be given in a way that can be used by a company. Otherwise, all it does is reside as a script in your local or in your, in your GitHub or in your cloud or whatever it is. So what needs to happen is then deployment. You need to put it, make it into a way where there is a pipeline that will automate the model you or the solution you have and be able to spin it into other applications. So at that point, you will end up using one of uh, these many deployment services. For example, the most common one, AWS, uh, offers obviously cloud computing, the clusters, and so forth. Another one, Kafka, actually owned by Amazon. Same exact idea, you could build apps on it, so your apps can hold 
um, your actual models as well as do some sort of output for your models. Docker, if you want to store things into what we call an image, an image is very similar to the idea of uh, way back for those, so I'm going to date myself, but way back in the day, I remember when I was a poor kid and I had to learn how to pirate games. And uh, as a result, what I, I got very familiar with images because what you would do is burn what's called a CD image, but that really is just you are pretending you actually have this drive that holds your CD in it. And it's the same idea here. You are now creating an image where you could work within kind of a local environment that does not get affected by things outside of it. So it's very handy for you can make all sorts of mistakes and it won't blow up your computer. That basically is the end of the, end of the day what, uh, what, uh, what's the main benefit to it. And then often what's also not mentioned here is some sort of maintenance. You will, after a while, the models no longer performs well. There are new information you have and you start inserting more. Uh, uh, you go take it back to the drawing board or you find ways to actually make certain changes to actually reflect uh, what new data tells you, okay? Whew. A lot, the, but that's why I said there's, uh, this is more of hope, getting you, letting you guys see this is the entire uh, ecosystem of data science, but also how, what are things you should be aware of when you're, getting, when you're looking to get started. And uh, of course, certainly we didn't cover all of it, but usually you should look to see if when you're looking to get some sort of training and understand how to build your skills in data science, you should look to see does it relate to one of these core skills. And if it doesn't, no matter how much you read those articles or whatever, how easy to make it look, it unfortunately probably just junk, okay? So uh, best of luck. And if you guys are going to join the program, also I, I will see you guys in the program. Question? Yeah, I think you alluded to a little bit uh, that people will start doing maybe AI. Mm -hmm. So AI is actually, machine learning is just a branch of study in data science. So for example, you can end up doing data science and not be a machine learning engineer. So you're not involved in the machine learning component we just looked at. For example, you could maybe what you're actually asked to do is solve maybe a lot of client questions using just statistical tests even. Or for example, you, and by the way, you can be a data scientist and just use Excel. And that doesn't make you a quote unquote fake data scientist. A data scientist is as long as you understand how to examine data, derive value from it, and ask questions and solve problems other people can't, you're a data scientist. That's much harder, of course, easier, much easier said than done. Machine learning is essentially the branch of where you train some sort of, where you train some sort of calculation under the scene that is able to automate then understanding on some form. Usually what that just means is you're able to solve complex math questions, okay? And that's actually, at the end of the day, very similar to what AI is. It's just some sort of, eventually the math question becomes so difficult to solve, you no longer can even rely on yourself to solve it. You have to induce through your understanding some sort of behavior that you can then automate into essentially series of complex equations that should mirror this type of behavior. That's essentially AI. So at the end of the day, it just still comes down to math. Uh, but technically computer science as well, uh, and this is why you also see computer science majors often have a heavy amount of math in it. It's because the computer science part then comes down to understand how to construct the, what we call the architecture of the task you are looking to replicate, uh, as well as how to make the equation in a way that could be computed efficiently. For example, you could solve technically any equation by just adding over and over, ad infinitum. And in fact, you'll see actually quite a few tasks. Sometimes they just reduce down to that level. But you might think, you might know from your computer science background that it is actually, if you do that, a computer is going to take a million years. Like you could have 10,000 computers working at the same time and it'll still take like a million years to arrive to the solution. But if you change the way it is answered, for example, maybe induce like multiplication, logging. Uh, I'll give you a much easier mathematical example. You could calculate with exponents or you could calculate with the log and summation, right? 
So those of you who have a little bit of math, math training. So by using that, you will recognize this is how I shrink down the amount of computational time needed for this behavior. So essentially, they're kind of like, I would say, data science, then machine learning, and some of machine learning does go outside of data science, the, some of the research aspects and so forth. And then AI, same exact idea. Okay. Other questions that folks may have? Okay. Uh, is there a threshold typically associated with data science? Um, not really, not really. Most, I mean, most tech places, I mean, most companies in tech, they're in some ways, unfortunately, almost embracing the tech bro culture a little too much. But because of that, there is, there, you tend to see that very often they're a little, they're very lax about these things. They just want, like, they know that like, good talent is so hard to find that they're willing to put up eccentricities. Like if you're a brilliant, if you're brilliant, you could show up in your underwear, no one's gonna question you. Now, you know, that's why you actually have scenarios where you have these folks who are like really core of their, like core of these companies and you hear about their weird habits like Steve Jobs soaking his feet in urine, right? Like, I mean, you're not gonna question him because like he's the only one who could do his, uh, come up with his, well, arguable. Yeah, that there's some, I'm not gonna go into it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I teach, uh, unfortunately, I, uh, it's, it cannot, it's not as deep as I would say to really be an NLP practitioner because it's just the lens that you're, you get in the program. It, to really properly teach NLP, to give you, give someone who's like starting off into an actual like core practitioner of NLP, it will require its own boot camp. Uh, it just uh, the program just doesn't have time for that. I, I can even tell you what I teach. I teach you how to manipulate text data in a way that can be used for visualization analysis purposes, and then I will show you traditionally how can you solve a problem with uh, two types of problem with uh, with text data that you are given. Like what is the tradition and the theorem behind those specific ideas and why they are used to solve those kind of problems. And that's really the limit of it. And then there's one other lecture in the deep learning part that shows you kind of the deep learn, how deep learning uh, informs more quote unquote, modern NLP uh, tasks. Um, in the immersive program, how many students are typically in one class? And 25. How many? 25. 25. And how many instructors do you see like, overall? How many different instructors and at one time? Oh, at one time, you see one instructor in the room at all times, uh, but there will be different instructors for different components of the course, obviously. So I think in the all world gamut, about four to five instructors in a room. We have three rooms, I think, upcoming for the uh, spring, two or three, I forget off the top of my head. Yeah, I'm getting uh, told to uh, get, get the, that I got to get out of here. All right. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I hope this was informative.